I still have joy. I still have joy. I still. Good evening, welcome to Be Inspired. We're live from the studio. May God bless you abundantly. I just arrived here making our way back from a very blessed service in our church in Tutin. And we said today in social media that we would be speaking to you about the heart in a way that per perhaps you've never understood uh, the heart in this particular way. On Sunday now, we will have the Lord's Supper of the New Heart. So during this whole week, we are preparing for this. Tomorrow, in the Night of the Soul, we are going to be speaking about... Well, I'm not going to say here now, because otherwise it's going to spoil the surprise. But um, let, let's go back to what we were saying to do with the heart. Because we're going to talk about Jacob. And we're going to see how Jacob is the perfect picture of someone who lives or who for a while, for a long time, lived off his emotions, his heart. Look what the Bible says here in the book of Genesis chapter 25. Verse 24 says, So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When, when Jacob was born, uh, as, as a child, as a baby, we could already see a lot about his personality because uh, he was a twin and naturally, even when you have twins, one has to be born first. And Jacob, as his brother came out, uh, as, as the, um, the nurse was helping with the, the birth of those two twins and, and she took a child out of the womb, out came this little hand from inside the womb. I imagine, I'm trying to picture that in my mind. This little hand came out out of the womb holding on to the heel of his brother. And we, knew, we know that Jacob grew up wanting what his brother had, even though he couldn't have it. He wanted something that he could not have. This is the one thing that by right belonged to his brother. Now we know that his brother didn't really value the blessing of the firstborn. The Bible is very clear about that. But that didn't give Jacob the right to took something or to take something that didn't belong to him. And in fact, once he decided that he was going to do it, once Jacob conceived in his heart that he wanted to take the blessing of the, the, the birthright, the firstborn, from his brother, his heart wanted that. It was then the heart's... Um, how can we put it? It was, it was then the heart's job to justify taking that, that blessing of the firstborn. It was more or less like this. I'm going to give you an example here. If we can go to the open shot, please, Shad. Have Pastor David here with me. Please, Pastor David, come here. It was more or less like this. 
So, <clears throat> Jacob knew that he couldn't have the blessing of the firstborn. But in his heart, he wanted it. And when the heart wants something, the heart starts to feed the person a thousand reasons why it's okay to have that, even when it's not okay. So everything, mentally speaking, in, in his mind, Jacob knew that what he was about to do was wrong. But his heart probably said, listen, it's okay because your brother doesn't want this blessing. And his brother may not have wanted the blessing, but that didn't give Jacob the right to lie, to pretend to be his brother to his father who was blind. And the job of the heart is this, once the heart wants something, and if you don't tame it, if we don't tame it, if we don't say to the heart, no, it is then the heart's job to feed the person a million reasons why it's okay to have something that they shouldn't have. Thank you, uh, Pastor David. And in order for you and for us to understand this better, uh, we have to understand something very clear. That Lucifer, Lucifer didn't fall from, from, the, the, from heaven because of the devil. Actually, he became the devil later, right? There was no devil around at that time. He was Lucifer. Lucifer didn't fall because of the devil, because again, he became the devil. So we can say, actually the Bible says that Lucifer said within his heart, I will be greater than God. I will put my throne above the throne of God. He said within his heart. And we can look at, at these examples of Jacob, of Lucifer. And again, please understand, I'm not putting Lucifer in the same bracket of Jacob. Of course not. Jacob later repented, became a man of God, and became Israel. But we can see here that if Lucifer was full of light, free from sin, and yet he fell because of his heart, imagine all of us can fall because of our heart. And the heart is, is a great salesman. He's a great salesman at telling you, you know when you go into a store, and you don't want to buy anything, you're just window shopping, you're killing time and you walk into a store and you find the salesman that you, you, he convinces you to get something, that's the heart. How many times, uh, Pastor Elijah, we, I don't know if this has happened to you, but this has happened to me on more than one occasion, where a person in the church, a lady in the church, came to, to me with a picture and, and, and said, Bishop, Pastor, pray for this man here because I love him. We, we're going to be together. Pray for God to see me with the same eyes that I see him because I love him and so on. And in talking to the person a little bit, we later found out the man was married. And because this person made up in her heart that she wanted this person, then the heart starts to feed the reasons why this is okay. So the person says, no, Bishop, but he doesn't love his wife. But it doesn't matter if he loves his wife or not. He's married. You shouldn't even concede, conceive in your heart the idea, the possibility of wanting to be with a person who's married. But once the person hears the voice of the heart and they don't pull the reins and say no, the heart then starts to feed a million reasons why it's okay to do what is not okay. Exactly. Uh, the heart convinces the people that the the right is wrong and the wrong is right. So the heart uh, drives the person to pursue something that is the heart dictating the rules. Is not our intelligence. Is not based on the word of God, on the pres on the you know the prescriptions and, and status and commandments of God. The heart is driving the person to take attitudes, to walk in paths which are ungodly. And the person is convinced that she's doing right because the heart is extremely de deceitful above all things. So the heart is the master in the, into deceit yeah. and, and works 
in the in the in, in the mind of the person the heart starts to work in place like a voice speaks inside of the person's mind yeah. in the person's mind and the person is fully convinced what she's doing is right you know I, I don't know if you know about this but th there are some documentaries for example <coughs> pardon me there are some documentaries where um, this these documentary programs go to prisons and they interview murderers they interview criminals and now you may not know this but it's, this is really interesting um, people who are in prison usually uh, or assist or Shad people keep saying here that it keeps cutting off and this is so important what we're saying I, I really hope that people are getting the chance it says here the video has frozen um, anyway let's let's continue here um, but going back to what we were saying there are documentary programs that go to prisons to interview people who are uh, serial killers for example and you may not know this or maybe you do but serial killers high-profile criminals they get a lot of fan mail I don't know if you know about this pastor, pastor know that, but this is no exaggeration uh, some of these people who were murderers of women for example serial killers of women somehow they get a lot of fan mail women who want to be with these men and marry these men now wh which person on their right mind says I want to marry a man who's in prison for killing 10 women 20 women only a person because there is uh, there is this thing sometimes of of women who like the bad boy the bad boy image is the heart because the mind tells you you're gonna get yourself into trouble this guy is going to hurt you take advantage of you but the heart says no but this is an edgy kind of guy an adventurous kind of guy living the moment kind of guy and and the mind knows that this person is heading to an abyss but the heart speaks louder there are two voices there's a voice of the heart and the voice of the mind surely when when Jacob was about to go to his father pretending to be Esau lying to him surely his mind says said um, don't do it don't do it actually when he was having a, a conversation with his mother right he said but what if what if my uh, brother finds out and the mother said no but you know then you can run away to it it's like he's maybe that that thing what if my brother wants to kill me or wants to hurt me that was his mind look this is not a good idea but the heart finds an excuse and this has been the reason why pastor David many people in the church they suffer they suffer because they know that following uh, making decisions based on how they feel is a recipe for disaster and yet they do it for example you cannot feel God this has to be uh, understood and accepted we still have many people who attend the church for a long time and say oh you know I felt God I felt God you cannot feel God you don't see anywhere in the Bible the Bible saying that anyone felt God you don't feel God you you understand what he wants for your life you live by this and this is where the assurance that he is with you comes from but you don't feel God anything when it, when someone says I felt this I felt that it's a worrying thing to to hear because we know the the moment you say I feel or I don't feel or feel you are putting your mind to the side surely Jacob felt that he had the right to go and take over that blessing because his brother didn't want it even though he knew he was wrong and 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 he eventually eventually there was forgiveness reconciliation with his family and God above all but he suffered many years because of that decision based on the heart and that's the problem Bishop because the heart makes the person only think about the here and now it, the, it because it's it's the source of feelings the person is only thinking about how am I going to feel now if I marry this person, I'm going to feel good. He's going to make me feel good. Even this serial killer, the thrill of being with a, with a man like this. They, they all, the, the, the only thing that the person is thinking about is how they are going to feel at that particular moment. But 
when you go by your heart, you forget about the consequences of those decisions that you make. And you may feel good for a time or for that period or because you made that decision. But later on, not only are you going to feel bad because the consequences are going to be terrible, but your life is going to be destroyed, which is what we've seen. We've seen many people, you know, I, I've personally seen this, people who made serious mistakes in their love life, Bishop, because the heart will always convince, you know, this person because, you know, you grew up together or you're from the same town or, you know, your parents know each other or because you're this age, he's that age, you both like this, you both have this, your heart will tell you so many things and you think, my goodness, if I get with this person, I'm going to feel so good, it's going to be so great. The person gets married and there's a disaster. Even, even when, Pastor Elijah, for example, even when the Bible gives us so many reasons that we must forgive. But there are people who read that in the Bible, they hear the pastor speaking about this and they don't do it. The Bible says like this, if you cannot love someone that you can see, how can you love God that you cannot see? So for example, I, if I hate someone, if I hate you or I hate Pastor David or whoever, it's not the case, but if, if I do, but I say that I love God, how hip hypocritical is that? Because it's easier, sure, to love someone that you can see than someone you can't see. And we can't, we can't see God. The Bible says that if we do not forgive, we also will not be forgiven. But even with all these things on the table, based on the Bible, the person allows their heart to dictate to them, Exactly. no, don't forgive because the, some people say, no, the person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. But do I deserve to be forgiven by God? I don't and still He forgives me. So if I don't deserve and still He forgives me and I'm thankful for that, why should I not forgive someone? Because you don't forgive because the person deserves. Forgiveness is not given because the person deserves. Forgiveness is given because it's the right thing to do that God commands us to yeah. do. And I think that the people need to understand that not just about forgiveness but everything that relates to the heart. The person must understand that the heart plays against faith. Mm -hmm. The heart is the enemy of faith. So in terms of forgiveness, the person will not feel to forgive. Our heart will never feel to forgive. So it's, it's rather a decision making that one needs to do and use our intelligence based upon the Word of God to understand that forgiveness in every other matter is about compliance, it's about obedience, it's about following what God is telling us to do rather than what our heart is pushing and drive us to do. Yeah. So just like Jacob held on to Esau's heel, your heart is going to hold on to the heel of the idea that he wants. If the heart wants you to pursue a relationship that is wrong, your heart is going to hold on to the heel of that relationship and give you a million reasons why it's okay. <laughs> Some people say, no, I know it's wrong, but it's because my wife didn't give me love. Well, your wife didn't give you love, but that doesn't give you a reason to cheat, for example, or, or, or to betray the person. So there's always a reason. I, I, I stole because I was going hungry. But there are many people here who are going hungry and they didn't steal. They worked two jobs, three jobs. They, they did what they couldn't do, but they never stole. And if you did these things in your past before you came to the Lord Jesus, of course, we're not judging you. Everyone has a past before they came to the Lord Jesus. But we're saying that no amount of justification covers what is wrong. The heart will always pursue what is wrong. The, and, and, and we'll try to justify that. But when we, when we receive the new heart that is given by the Lord Jesus, when we ask for it, because God is the one who gives us the new heart, that's why this, uh, this Sunday we will have the Lord's Supper of the new heart. I have here the elements of the, the Lord's Supper here in my hand on Sunday when you come to the church you will receive a cup like this that is prepared beforehand in our, in our church. We have a special machine that prepares this in a very hygienic way that is uh, sealed, shut and tight so that no contamination, no dirt, no anything can get to it. 
you will receive a cup with the bread and the, the grape juice symbolizing the, the bread of the Lord, the blood of the Lord Jesus like this. And you will then ask God to give you this new heart. But it's like we said on Sunday, God is the surgeon. He does the transplant. But you need to put yourself on the operating table. You need to say, here I am, Lord. I don't want to be like this anymore. Because there is no heart surgeon that chases after someone to bring them to the hospital. The person has to make their way to the hospital and say enough is enough of this old heart that doesn't work anymore. That's what we are going to do now this Sunday in the Lord's Supper of the new heart. I want to pray for you now that um, you've been struggling, you, you've been a Jacob perhaps, who knows. You've been someone that wants your heart latches onto something that it wants, wants your heart holds on to the heel of an idea. You then allow yourself to eat off the excuses that your heart gives you for doing something that you know is wrong. And that has been a cause for destruction for you. Maybe it's not lack of prayer. It's not lack of coming to the church. It's not lack of any of these things. Pastor Elijah, the reason why many people don't become tithers because of the heart. In the mind they know, I need to be faithful to God. The Bible tells me I need to be faithful to God. But the heart says no just overlook that you you, yeah. you you don't want to do that and and the heart says you have you have little if you give you're going to be poorer mm -hmm. and and we understand it is not about having much and actually there are many who have a lot and the heart tells you have a lot and and it's too much to give so mm -hmm. if you have little the heart says it's too little it's too little if you have too much so your type's going to be too much. So the heart always finds a way to mm -hmm. to play his role, to justify um, his means, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we just have to put the heart aside and, and follow the yeah. instructions of God's Word for our own good. Understand your enemy. That's right. Your heart is your enemy. Notice your greatest enemy is not the devil. Your greatest enemy is your heart. Understand how your enemy works. Bishop, how can you say that? Well, the Bible says that. The heart is desperately wicked. <laughs> it says that, oh, that, that the source of evil in this world is the heart. Murders come from the heart. All these evil things come from the heart. So understand your enemy. Understand how it works. The heart asks for something. And once it wants something, it won't shut up until... Until you give it what he wants. And once you give it what he wants, he wants more. And that only brings destruction. On the opposite, we speak about in the church, intelligent faith. This is what changes lives. I want to pray for you right now. Pastor David is going to begin the prayer. Um, we're going to pray right now for those who want, who want to uh, let go of what the heart wants. The heart wants what it wants. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's no reason or rhyme. Is that how they say it? Or rhyme or reason? I believe rhyme or reason, Bishop. Okay. Thank you, Pastor David. Uh, you didn't inspire a lot of confidence. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I think it's, there's no rhyme or reason why the heart wants. It just wants something. The heart is, is like a spoiled brat. It's like the, the, the blind is... is makes um, the one blind. That it makes it the person blind. The person has blinkers. You can't see anything yeah. on the sides, right? The heart is like a spoiled brat. You can tell it that this is not good for you. This is going to make you sick. This is The heart won't shut up. And uh, I, I remember, I remember how my, my mother used to, to deal with my brother who had these hissy fits. In the supermarket or in the store when he wanted something, she would just ignore him. And then when he would get home, there would be a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how the heart has to be. Because the more you, 
you feed the heart what it wants, the more it grows, the more it takes over your life. But intelligent faith starves the heart. And the more you feed intelligent faith, the more it grows, the, more str the stronger it becomes so you can lead your life in the path of God's Word. If you want to do that, we want to pray for you. And tomorrow, the night of the soul will be crucial, crucial for you who are in this purpose of the new heart. Pastor David is going to begin the, the prayer. Let's talk to God. My Lord and my Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord, we thank you for this understanding that you have given to us. And we ask on behalf of all those who are watching us, who are listening to us now, perhaps there are many who have been struggling with decisions that they've made based on feelings, based on the demands, the heart has been given to them. My God, help this person and deliver them, my Lord. Help them to separate their heart, separate their feelings from their faith. To always remember, my Lord, that their biggest enemy is their heart. And though they may desire something so much, though they may think something is going to be so good for them, if they have, my Lord, help them to understand that what is good for them are the things that you want for them. Is when they obey you, is when they decide to trust in you, is when they listen to your instruction, my God. Because your instruction always goes against what our heart is telling us to do. So help this person, my God, who is in between two minds on a decision they need to make in their love life. Or their finances. Or perhaps with their family. Or for their future. This person, my God, who doesn't know which direction to take. Their heart is telling them to go one way. But their mind, faith is telling them to go a totally different way. My Lord, I ask you to help them, give them strength to ignore what their heart is telling them to do, to be, to be radical with making this decision, with deciding to go against their feelings so that they can do all that you are asking them to do. My God, in this way, we are sure that your people will glorify you and they will remain in faith until the end. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In Jesus' name, we bless your life here from the studio. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want to invite you to make sure that tomorrow you do not miss the night of the soul. If you can, you, you should uh, come to the service at 7.30 p.m. But if for some reason you can't, then please do come, do attend at either 7 in the morning or 10 or 3 p.m. And you who want, you received in the church on Wednesday, on Sunday rather, uh, a heart with a space for you to write the things that you don't want in your heart anymore. Maybe you've been unable to forgive for a long time. Maybe you've carried things in your past inside of your heart that you haven't dealt with. You carry this like a weight inside of you. Maybe you've become insensitive to the things of God, cynical with the things of God. For you, there was a time that the things of God were precious, valuable to you, but now you, you always have a chip on your shoulder to do with the things of God. And you don't want your heart to be like that anymore. Then we, we gave you on, on Sunday in the church a, a heart of paper with a, a, the image of stone there for you to write the things that you don't want to control your heart anymore. And this Sunday now, the Sunday of the new heart, when you take part of the Lord's Supper, you will leave this paper on the altar to say no more. And we've invited you who want also to bring inside your envelope an offering to help the work of the church, the maintenance work of the church. I have Pastor Elijah here with me uh, who looks after the engineering department of the church. 
and we have uh, large projects going on. We have the facade of the rainbow that is being done. That is a major work. We have our church there in, in Nottingham. Yes, we're currently refurbishing our, our church in Nottingham. Um, works are, are in progress at the moment. Um, we also have some building works um, at the roof being done in Plasto at the in Plasto, moment. Yes. yes. And we, we just finished completely re-roofing the church in Wilsdon Green and Stanford Hill. And Stanford Hill. Not, a, not patchwork. It was a completely re-roofing of these two churches because uh, the building was being damaged. Yes, there was leaks and even uh, structural damage. Yeah. So it, it is those things that we just need to, yes. to intervene. Actually, and they are very close, costly, Bishop. Very costly, yes. Yeah. You're going to see now a video of the, the building works that are being done if you didn't have a chance to see that on Sunday. And we will see you here tomorrow at the same time for the program. God bless you. Bye-bye. A well-equipped church is to the kingdom of God as a regiment is to an army. Not only are the lost and afflicted saved there, but also those who are saved are prepared to embrace the great battle to save souls around the world. With each new church that is opened and every existing one that is maintained, the kingdom of God advances further, bringing light to those in darkness. Here are some of the refurbishment works lined up for and ongoing in 2022. In London, our Finsbury Park headquarters needs major work regarding water infiltration and leaking. This has resulted in intensive rejoining work conducted on the facade of the building in order to make it watertight. Our Edmonton location has had the altar and the baptism area recently refurbished. Our Hammersmith location is having its toilet rooms refurbished, as well as having new radiators fitted in the CBC and overflow area. Due to wear and tear, the main staircase has also needed some detailed touch-ups on the handrails and the step guards. Our Plasto location is also undergoing roof repair works and has recently had its baptism area completely refurbished. Our Stamford Hill location has needed new roofing as well as some essential refurbishment work in the baptism pool area, stairs and walls. Our Wilston Green location has also recently had roofing work completed. Our East Midlands location in Nottingham is currently undergoing a complete makeover as the acquired building needs total refurbishment. From the entry hall to the auditorium and right up to the ceiling, this location is expected to become a hub of blessed activity in the area very soon. Lives will continue to be saved and restored here, to the glory of God. Each one of these buildings is a part of a great work that goes far beyond what human hands can do. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Let's come together to make these works a success and may God bless your projects and all the work of your hands. With my Lord